Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Follow the Boat. I have a little surprise guest here who decided to come and join me. Right, when we last left you, we were working our way up the coastline towards uh, Krabby Boat Lagoon with a broken dodger. So that's one of the reasons why we came back. But one thing that we haven't yet discussed is our installation of lithium batteries. And that was the reason why we were heading back to KBL. So this episode is dedicated to that installation if you're interested in lithium batteries on a boat, I think you're going to find this episode particularly interesting. If you do, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. Yes. Right, let's talk lithium. I'm here with Paul Bushell of Octopus Electrical Services uh, based in Phuket. We've known Paul for a few years now. If you watched our haul out or drop back in after our uh, time of PSS a few years ago, Paul's the one that took the drone footage. So I uh, wanted to invite Paul over to help us install our new system. Now, as you know, I've installed our solar panel system, but I thought it would be prudent to invite a qualified electrician and give us some pointers. Uh, also, Paul is going to be installing a completely new battery management system. Before we do all that, Paul, just a couple of quick questions. We've got this great six volt Trojan series. Uh, we're doing well with the new solar panels, doing very well on our management system. Why would anyone think about going to lithium? Okay, the big differences these days with the lithium, and it's, it's lithium phosphate, big difference to the lithium ion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you're aware with phones, uh, there is reports of fires. Okay, that's lithium ion. Um, the lithium phosphates tend to be much, much more stable mm -hmm. and you don't get a fire risk from these batteries. The second thing that um, is very, very good is with them is their lifespan. Yep. Okay, now the standard lithiums that we use, which are uh, Cal B's, um, which is China Aviation Battery Limited, um, we import them. The, these batteries uh, have a life of what they call 2,000 cycles. Now, a normal lead acid will only have 500 cycles. And we're talking, this is not 50% discharge like this in the lead acids. This is 90%, yeah, you know, sure. close to 100% discharge. Yeah. The lithiums after 2,000 cycles have 80% of their original capacity left. So you're going 90% every day, 5,000 cycles you're looking at 10 years. Mm -hmm. At the end of that 5,000 cycles, you've got 70% of the original capacity left. Mm -hmm. Then you go to 10,000 cycles and you've got 60%. That's 30 years. Mm -hmm. Another good thing about them is that lead acids, when you get an older battery or bank, you can't add new lead acid batteries to that bank. With lithiums, you, so the stats say is you can add further batteries to old batteries. So you can keep expanding your bank as your original bank gets a little bit older. One other thing that's very important that people don't realize is that if you go for a, a lead acid battery system, right, and let's talk a, um, a 400 amp hour mm -hmm. banking battery system, which is usually two of the big N200 batteries, sure. or a top quality deep cycle one of those, is about 800 US dollars, give or take, okay? The two of those, is 1600 US dollars. And you can only use 50%. One lithium battery gives you 180 amp hours of usable battery. So you replace two batteries with one. Quarter the size, quarter the weight. We are effectively, although we're looking at around about the same amperage, we're effectively doubling our capacity. You've doubled your a usable capacity. Okay. And halved your space. Are they more sensitive? Do we have to be a bit more careful about how they're charged? Um, the biggest downside to a lithium, if you 100% flatten it, you throw them in the bin. Now, in theory, that's what they say. In practice, you may get away with another two or three. You can get it back again, but you have to take it. The worst case scenario is you flatten it 100%, you throw your money away. Okay, so. It's very, very important, in my opinion, that you have a battery management system. Sure. Now, we only sell the batteries with a battery management system. We've been doing them now for seven years, and we have not had one cell fail in that time. 
okay? Um, and we've put them into over 50 boats now. So, yeah, they're going very, very well, very impressed. What happens with the battery? You've got four cells and each one of those cells has to be balanced. A lead acid battery, what happens is that they are supposed to be balanced as well, but because when you're charging lead acid, if one cell gets full, it still lets current pass through and that's when they start to gas, the batteries will charge the other cells. Now in a lithium phosphate battery, once the battery's full, it passes no more current. Mm -hmm. So that battery's full and these other ones are now down and they'll get lower and lower as time goes on. So you have to put little balancing units on it so that it basically shorts out the full one and these ones pass as current so these ones can then come up and be full again. And so they all end up at the same level all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to have them on a lithiums. Um, the other thing is that the battery management system does, if, if you flatten the batteries down to 90%, we turn them off. So effectively we're trying to install an idiot proof system that not only manages it, but more importantly, cuts it off when it reaches that last 10%. Correct. The other thing that people don't realize is that if you take 100 amps out of a lead acid, you have to put 120 back. If you take 100 amps out of a lithium, you have to put 105 back. So they're 15% more efficient on charging. Secondly, a lead acid starts to deteriorate when the temperature gets to 25 degrees C or sure. above 25 degrees C. Lithiums will go to 50 degrees so they're C. More, much, more tolerant. much more tolerant to temperature. Mm. Um, one of the little downsides to it is that your alternator will work really, really hard with a lithium. Okay, it's going to, it puts out, the alternator will put out nearly 100% of its output until the batteries are 95% full. Then they'll taper off. So if you're eating fan belts when you're using a lead acid, you're going to really eat them when you eat, when you have a lithium. So you've either got to reassess how your alternator is driven, um, and usually if it's a single A belt and you've got over 80 amp alternator, you're going to start to eat fan belts. Mm -hmm. So you need to either limit the alternator's output and also put a temperature control on. Most, up to 80 amps, usually the alternators are 100% rated. So you can run 80 amps continually, but you get a 100 amp alternator, they're probably 70% duty cycled. So if you run them at 100, 100 120 amps, they'll burn out. Mm. Physically, will get so hot that the windings will burn. So we recommend that you put a temperature sensor on them and like the Belmar regulators, they have the control so they'll turn the alternator off if it gets hot. So we're going to set to and start uh, examining the system that we're going to install, uh, which by the way is a combined shore power charger and a three kilowatt pure sine wave inverter in one unit. Yep. And then we're adding a transformer, which is going to allow us to step up 110 to 220 volts when eventually we go over to the States. One other advantage is that you isolate your boat from shore power. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> having an isolation transformer, you're now air gapped. So the power comes in, it goes through a transformer and it goes out to your boat. So you cannot get DC electrolysis when you're on shore power, um, as long as you're keeping the earth isolated. But that's very, very important, especially for aluminium steel boats. Yeah. We have to increase the size of the battery cables for the inverter, because we were putting a 3000 watt inverter in. Sure. You know, and at full load, that inverter can do 6000 watts mm. for a short period of time. Mm. And that's quite a lot of amps. That is. You know, so we need to put a big fuse in so that if something goes wrong, the fuse blows, it doesn't burn all the wires. The lithiums can deliver a very great deal of power. So they'll, they'll deliver, you, you, like, 200 amp hour battery, we can flatten it in 20 minutes if we draw that much power. Consequently, we can also charge it in 20 minutes. If you can feed it with 600 amps, okay, you can charge it in 20 minutes. Mm. You know, so all these capabilities are there. They're designed for cars and high drawing. We're not going to be drawing that sort of power, so they never get hot in, in a boating environment. Mm. Okay, right, well, let's set to it then, Paul. Let's go. We're now putting these in and you can see how much less space they use up. There we go. So there's 400 amp hours. The 
same as what 800 amp hours would be yeah. in a lead acid. Yep. Okay, we, we're tossing up whether to put the inverter down here next to the batteries. Keeping in mind that these batteries don't gas, so you've got no acids coming out. The big issue in the small confined space is the cooling. The inverter, if it's going on heavy load or heavy charging, needs to um, have some airflow. And in that confined space, there's not enough airflow. However, because we're limited in space, we could put a little thermostat in there with a fan so that if it, when it does get warm, the fan turns on and then once it's um, lost being hot, fan turns off. So do one of the little fridge fans with an LED readout. We can change the temperature easily if we wanted to turn it off and on. Um, the inverters these days don't fail on heat. They usually just derate. So if they get hot instead of 3000 watts, they're going to be 2000 and the same with the charging instead of being 120 amps they'll de degrade automatically so but it's still better not to, not to take them over 50 degrees we have this here this turns the the power off to the battery and it actually turns the charging off as well now if there was a fault occurred why do, the question is why do we want to turn charging off because it'll be a like a flat battery but yeah but one of the things can be is, hypothetically, one of these cells goes faulty. Now, if one cell goes faulty, we've now got three cells taking 14 volts. Mm. So we then overcharge those three cells and destroy them. Mm -hmm. So by turning the power off to here, to the batteries, we, we, we are now protected for over voltage or under voltage. So if any one of these cells goes over four volts, the system turns off. If any one of the cell goes below 2.5 volts, the system turns off. So, and that protects all of the battery. That blue box is just the relay. It's just like an on-off relay, but it doesn't consume power. Yep. If you have a normal relay, it's consuming half an amp all the time, 24 hours a day. You know, and that ends up being 12 amp hours, as an example. These are FETs, so they consume close to zero power. Right. Um, so we put those in, and then this little unit here um turns this on and off yep and it also turns the inverters charging and sucking on and off as well Now I'm just setting the inverter to lithium mode and also set the charge rate, the maximum charge rate in the inverter. Okay, well, we'll just do an overview now of what we've done. We've now finished the job. Um, we've put the batteries in down here um, and they've got covers over the top so if there's any spillage on them, um, it doesn't damage the, um, the cell monitors. We've kept it very, very compact. And because of this, we, the box is going to need to have cooling in it. So it just needs air circulation. Uh, and we've installed a thermostat, a fan. So the thermostat's going to turn on at 30 degrees. Or, or if we want to raise that to 35 or 40, you can control the temperature for the fan to turn on. And then when it drops down again, the fan's going to turn off. So we, we don't waste power all the time when we don't need to. We've also added a battery monitor so that um, we can see the incoming current and the outgoing on the system completely. And we also can monitor battery voltage and the engine battery. One other thing that the battery alarm, the battery monitor gives us is the facility to put an alarm on. So we've set the alarm to go off at 12.5 volts. Now on a lithium system, the voltage 
will stay at about 13.2 volts nearly all the time until the last 20%. Then it's going to fall off a cliff. So you'll find it'll go 13, 12.9 quite quickly. So once it gets to 12.5, we need an alarm to go off so that we know to start the charge motor or start a generator to charge the batteries again. And we've also installed a color monitor that gives us all the AC information, where it's coming from, how much is coming from shore power, how much is coming from the boat's inverter. It also shows all the DC systems. So it gives you a full overview of the boat. And you can also look at this remotely when you're off the boat through the internet, through, through a thing called VRM. These devices all connect with Bluetooth. Um, so you can monitor it all on your phone as well. And that's about it guys. Hopefully um, you're interested in Vitron and give us a call. Information, questions, happy to give you my opinions whenever. Thank you. So big thank you to Paul Bushel there for his time. And just to give you a quick recap, the lithium batteries are made up of four cells each, unlike a lead acid, and each cell is about 3.2 volts. And they have this little balancing battery management system on top of each cell, and that will cut out through overcharging or undercharging. Now, as you know, uh, we charge our batteries through the solar and via the alternator. The alternator is controlled by a Stirling alternator to battery controller, and that uh, has a temperature sensor on it. So if you remember Paul talking earlier about 120 amp alternators, which is what ours is, has a little temperature sensor on there. Um, one of the concerns, of course, was that airflow. So we have retrofitted this um, 220 volt thermostatically controlled fan. The 220 side of the charging system is controlled by that Victron BMS. And of course, the MultiPlus charger itself. Now I expect you'll want to know the cost breakdown of this. It's quite difficult to quantify the costs exactly because of different exchange rates. Unfortunately, here in Thailand, we do suffer from a very strong BART exchange rate at the moment. So I think we pay probably a little bit over the odds for the gear, but uh, of course you can go online and you can see the cost of those, but expect to spend anything between $1,500 and $2,000 per 100 amp hour battery, just as a rough ballpark. Uh, the MultiPlus is going to set you back anything up to about $2,000 as well. So all in, you can see that this system is starting to cost quite a bit of money. And we paid in the region of around about $6,000. Now that does include a discount that Paul very kindly gave us in exchange for profiling uh, Octopus's services. Links below to Paul's contact details and to Octopus as well. So if you've got any further questions, then please, Paul would be happy to answer them. But I guess this solution isn't really something for weekend sailors. It's a big setup cost, but where it is potentially beneficial is to full time liverboards, which is of course what we are. So it's going to be interesting to see how we get on with this system. And of course, we're going to be updating you on that as we start our long journey towards Japan and the Pacific Northwest, starting very, very soon with this trip down the Sumatran coastline. So that's going to be a real test of the system. And of course, we are going to be following it up with further um, looks at our induction system, which we're going to be putting on in replacement for our gas system. This is for cooking on board. So we're going to have a pretty comprehensive uh, breakdown of how we get on with that. We're going to be comparing how much energy is used between different devices using that multi-plus inverter and the induction cooker. So if you're interested in this, uh, please do keep uh, liking the video please share it and if you haven't yet subscribed then please do so because then you get notified of our future episodes of course and if you really do like our videos then please do consider becoming a supporter it really does help us you can do it through paypal by just using our rum fund one-off payment scheme or you can go via patreon so check out followtheboat.com forward slash thanks or patreon.com forward slash follow the boat peace and fair winds.